Welcome everyone to this introduction to TRACE webinar. So before we start, we'd just like to give a shout out and a thank you to Bellaterra, our partners, for their support and promotion of this introduction to TRACE webinar. Okay, so um, my name is Jolene Tan. I'm moderating today's session. I am the communications lead at TRACE. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. Um, I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. First, we have Mark Titley, who is a research associate at TRACE. He will be giving the initial presentation on TRACE. Mark works in the impact team at TRACE. He analyzes and interprets TRACE data for key audiences, mainly in importing markets. He has a PhD in conservation ecology from Durham University. Also present with us is Andre Vasconcelos, who is the TRACE Global Engagement Lead. He will be on hand to answer questions during the Q&A. Andre has 13 years of experience in developing and implementing projects focused on the conservation and sustainable use of natural resources, environmental regularization, ecological restoration, and forest certification. He has an M Science in Biodiversity Conservation from the University of Oxford. Uh, not pictured here, but also present is my colleague Athena, um, who is uh, in the communications team with me, and she will be sharing useful information in the chat, chat box from time to time. So uh, look out for that, for links and other information from Athena. Great, so those are the introductions. Before we hear from Mark, um, I'd love to hear first from all of you, from those of you attending this webinar, we have a quick poll. This should appear on your screens now. We would like to know how well you know Trace right now. Would you say you know Trace not at all, a little, fairly well, or very well? So just a few seconds now for everybody to get their answers in. And anybody else? Any last last minute voters? No? Okay. Um, we're going to end the poll now. And it looks like about half of you would say that you know Trace a little. Um, another third or so say you know Trace not at all. And a small number say you know Trace fairly well. So um, that's great, that's fine. Um, the whole purpose of today is to help introduce Trace to those who uh, don't know it very well or not at all, or just want to, want to learn a bit more. Um, so great to have all of you with us today. Um, so don't forget that there will be a Q&A session later. Feel free to stick questions in the Q&A box as the presentation goes on. But I'm now going to hand over to Mark who will tell us more about trace, uh, trace methods, our data, and what you can do with it. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Jolene, and hello, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Mark, and I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking to you about what trace is, how we map the global supply chains um, that drive tropical deforestation, and uh, show you how you can access our data yourselves. TRACE is a program and a partnership between two founding partners, which are the Stockholm Environment Institute and Global Canopy, which is an NGO based in the UK. As well as that, we work with a variety of other partners, which include NGOs in producer countries. So that includes Origa in Indonesia and Ima Flora in Brazil. And we also work with a variety of research partners at academic institutions around the world. I should also acknowledge uh, our several funders, without which, of course, none of this work would be possible. So what is TRACE? TRACE is a data-driven transparency initiative that maps the international trade and financing of agricultural commodities that drive tropical deforestation. If you go to our website at trace.earth, you can find three kinds of information that we supply. Firstly, our trace supply chains, uh, which map these connections between tropical deforestation and consumer markets. 
We also have information on the financing of these supply chains via our Trace Finance website. And also Trace Insights, where we produce specific pieces of analysis, uh, policy briefs, and case studies that make use of our data. Trace maps the middle part of the supply chain. That means we connect consumer markets and trading companies to sourcing regions and associated deforestation impacts in these regions. So look at it another way, we go from municipalities of production, so specific places within producer countries such as Brazil, and we then follow the, the production of that soy and its processing through facilities such as um, soy crushing silos, or in the case of beef, it would be slaughterhouses, then through ports, exporters, importers, and we go as far as the port of, uh, the port of import in the destination country. What this means is we don't go all the way down to the farm level uh, in the producing country, generally, and we don't go further downstream in the supply chain than the port or country of import. The reason we do that is because there is um, a trade-off between the geographic scale that we can cover and also the supply chain detail that we can go into. And what we feel, um, we, we strike a balance here between covering as many commodities and countries as possible. So we cover about two thirds now, um, getting towards 70% of the global trade in forest risk commodities. And we also capture that really important trade step that connects the deforestation to consumption. So which countries and commodities do we cover? We have quite a large focus in South America. So in Brazil, we cover the broadest range of commodities, and this includes soy, maize, beef, chicken, pork, coffee, cocoa, and cotton. We also cover selected commodities in Paraguay, Argentina, Ecuador, and Colombia. Later this year, we hope to release data on Brazilian soy too. In Asia, we have a focus on uh, Indonesian palm oil and wood pulp, while in Africa, we focus on uh, cocoa from Cote d'Ivoire, which is by far the world's biggest cocoa producer. So who uses Trace and what can they use it for? One of our main target audiences are companies who can use our data to understand how they might be exposed to tropical deforestation in their own supply chains. Um, they can use that information to prioritize which suppliers to engage with to try and tackle the problem. And they can also identify regions in producing countries where they might want to target landscape scale approaches. We also work with and are used by importing country governments who can use trace data to identify hotspots of uh, deforestation that they might be importing from particular countries or in particular commodities. We hope that they can use this information to design better policies and also inform dialogue between producer countries and consumer countries. We also are used by investors and asset managers who can use Trace to um, screen their portfolios for deforestation exposure and carry out due diligence assessments. Finally, we're used by NGOs and the media to help hold some of these other actors accountable. This slide shows a screenshot from a website called resourcetrade.earth. And this shows the kind of information that's readily accessible on global trade. So for example, this shows Brazil's soy exports in 2020. And this is useful information because we can see how much soy is being exported from Brazil to which destination countries. So we can see, for example, that China is a major export market for Brazilian soy. However, this information only gets us so far because we can't tell where in Brazil that soy has come from, from this information. And that's crucial if we want to connect it to deforestation impacts, which happen in very specific regions within Brazil. 
this is where we think trace data can be really useful. So next to show you what our trace data can show, this is the data that we have on China's soy imports from Brazil in 2020. So zooming in on Brazil and just the exports going to China, we can map where China is most likely to be exposed to deforestation. What we can see is that there's quite a broad distribution, but actually it's pretty concentrated in two regions, in the Cerrado biome in central and northeastern Brazil, and also in the Pampa biome in the southernmost part of Brazil. So the darker the colors on this map, the more deforestation that China was exposed to in 2020 from its soy imports. What's quite striking about this and what trace data can be really useful for is again, just showing how concentrated these impacts are. So for example, just half of China's, uh, sorry, up to half of China's deforestation exposure comes from just 30 municipalities, um, which make up just 7% of China's soy imports. So it's really concentrated in, in some specific places. As well as seeing how it's concentrated in uh, sort of geographically, we can also see how it's concentrated in particular companies and exporters. So 10 traders export 85% of the deforestation from these 30 municipalities. We hope that this information is useful because we can show um, clear entry points for targeting change, both within particular companies that, that we can then engage with or identifying particular regions within producer countries where action can be focused. Next, I'm just going to pause this presentation to show you our website and show you how you can access uh, some of our data yourselves. So if I go to our homepage, uh, this is at trace.earth. Um, you can find the three main pieces of information that in I introduced earlier. Today, I'm just gonna focus on the supply chain data that we have. Um, there we go. Sorry, there was a slight pause there. Um, if we click on this top panel, it will take us through to our supply chain tool. This gives us a menu of options of different commodities that we want to look at. And for this example, I'm going to focus on soy. So if we select soy and then select a particular country. For this example, I'm going to choose Brazil. We then get two options of the kind of visualization that we'd like to see. For this example, I'm going to choose the flow view because it shows those supply chain connections in a nice visual way. This then produces our supply chain tool. I'll just point out that on the top right corner here, we can select a language and change that into a different language if we prefer. So we could choose uh, simplified Chinese, for example. The map on the left shows production of soy in municipalities in Brazil. The rest of the diagram then shows how the production of that soy uh, is connected then through the supply chain, through exporters, importers, and ultimately the country of first import. If we like, we can choose particular countries to zoom in on. So we could use the search bar up here to find a country, or we can select a country interactively in the diagram. So if we choose France, for example, it will select just the flows of soy from Brazil that are destined for France. We can then expand that selection to zoom in on these to get more detail. So now we can see that the municipalities that France is sourcing from on the left, there's a much uh, reduced selection. There's a lot fewer of them now. And similarly, there are fewer traders involved uh, trading that soy that's destined for France because we've filtered it down. So far, this is just showing trade volume in tons. But what we might be interested in is impacts on the ground, such as deforestation. To look at that, we can change units here in this top panel and choose a different thing to measure. So here I'm going to choose soy deforestation exposure. 
this has updated the map now uh, and the uh, chart with um, uh, hectares of soy deforestation exposure that France is exposed to from its soy imports from Brazil. And again, we can see now there's really quite a small number of municipalities that concentrate most of that exposure and an even smaller number of traders that are involved. I'll also point out that along the bottom here, you can choose different years to show the data. So this is automatically selected 2020, which is the most recent data that we have available for Brazilian soy. Um, but we could choose a different year, such as 2019, and see how the patterns change. So yes, here now we can see how, in fact, just one trader, Bungie, uh, accounts for more than half of France's deforestation exposure uh, for Brazilian soy. Um, the other thing I'll show you is how to download this data. So if you go up to the top here, um, we have several other options that you can explore. I'll show you the download page. And here we can either download entire data sets for particular commodities and countries in bulk. So we could download all of our Brazilian soy data, for example. Or if we scroll down, we can create a custom data set. Um, essentially, we can filter that data for specific countries or companies or things we'd like to measure uh, and get a more bespoke data set to answer a specific question. The final thing I'll show you um, back up on this top panel is our data explorer. And this is just a slightly different way of showing our data. It shows the same data that we have, but hopefully in a more um, easy to interact with way that we're currently trialing. So if you go to our data explorer, again, we get the option to select particular countries, commodities, and what we'd like to measure. Uh, here it's selected Brazilian soy by default. So I'm just going to click Explore. And this will automatically generate a series of charts and maps uh, and figures um, on our Brazilian soy data. So we can see which countries are the biggest importers of Brazilian soy in terms of deforestation exposure. We can see which traders, so which exporters, and also which importers are the most important. And it will also generate a map of the regions of production. And just like with the supply chains tool that I showed you before, we can filter this data for particular countries or companies that we're interested in. So we could show just uh, the imports going to China, for example. When we do that, it will update the map. And here we can see the results that I showed earlier, showing how China's soy imports um, are exposed to risk specifically in the Pampa region, in the southernmost part of Brazil, and in the uh, Cerrado in northeastern Brazil. So going back to the presentation, I'll now talk briefly um, about how we do this, how we map these supply chains, and uh, how you how sorts of data sets that we use. So our supply chain mapping approach is common to all of our commodities and countries, although the specific data sets involved um, sometimes vary, depending on uh, what is available in particular countries. We start in each case with per shipment trade information. This is really the backbone of our data sets. Uh, this is typically things like customs declarations and bills of lading. And this can give us um, really quite a lot of detail actually already. So it tells us the countries that are importing. It tells us the ports usually of import, the traders that are involved, and often the ports of export. So we can already get quite far um, into the supply chain just from the, the shipment information. It often includes other information too that can be really useful. And this is things like tax information for particular companies, which we can then use to make uh, further supply chain connections to particular facilities. Facilities are the next step that we try and connect these shipments to. And by this, I mean things like soy processing and storage facilities, oil palm uh, mills and refineries, or slaughterhouses for beef, for example. The final step is then to connect those facilities to particular production locations. <clears throat> 
To do all this, we use a combination of a logic-based decision tree, which connects these different data sets together based on the information that they contain and what we can deduce about what these connections look like. Where we can't do that all the way down the supply chain, what we do is some mathematical modeling. And this is particularly useful in this last step to connect facilities to production locations. So what data do we use? As I've said, shipment records are the starting points, and that's typically customs declarations and bills of lading. We then combine that with information on processing facilities. So this can be things like the ownership of those facilities, their specific locations, and their capacities. We also use other supply chain connections. So I've already mentioned information on tax that we can make use of. Um, but this could be other things too. So for example, in our beef supply chains, if we know that a particular shipment of beef is halal, then we can often connect that to specific halal slaughterhouses. We also use domestic transport data to understand how these commodities have moved around in the producer country prior to export. We also use production data. And finally, we use measures of jurisdictional sustainability. And by that, I mean, measures and indicators of environmental impacts in producing regions, such as deforestation exposure. So how do we measure deforestation exposure? This is the last step, really. So we've, we've already built our supply chain map. And now we're trying to understand if the actors in that supply chain are connected to deforestation. So in the example of soy, if we were interested in the export year of 2019, what we do is get a map of soy coverage in 2019. And we'd overlap that with a map of deforestation that's happened in a recent window of time before that export. In the case of soy, we use a window of five years, because that's the amount of time that we can be confident that the deforestation was motivated by soy production. By overlapping these two things, uh, we get a, a map of soy deforestation in 2019. So that's areas where soy has been produced in 2019 on recently deforested land. And in this example, let's say we've got 50 hectares. The very final step then is to distribute those 50 hectares amongst the uh, traders and the importing countries that are sourcing from this region. So let's imagine that we have a thousand tons of soy in this municipality being produced in 2019. And we know from our supply chain mapping that there are two traders in this example sourcing from this municipality. Uh, and let's say they're sourcing in a 40 to 60 ratio. What we'd simply do is distribute the 50 hectares of deforestation amongst those two traders in the same ratio. So trader A would be exposed to 20 hectares of deforestation, while trader B would be exposed to 30 hectares of deforestation. So that's um, a kind of summary of our methods. I'll also briefly mention trace finance, uh, which builds on that data and connects it to parent companies of those traders and the financing of those companies to understand how the finance sector might be exposed to deforestation. I won't say any more about that now, but if you're interested in the finance aspect of this, do check out our Trace Finance website, where there are lots more uh, resources uh, and, and other ways you can explore our data on there. I'll finish up this presentation by just sharing some impact highlights. So examples where Trace has been used in the real world. Firstly, uh, we were used by the French government to build a dashboard powered by Trace. And, and this dashboard looked at France's imports of soy, how they might be exposed to deforestation, and how that risk was concentrated in specific traders and in specific places within Brazil. We've also worked with the Tropical Forest Alliance and China Agricultural University to recommend actions that the Chinese government could take to address the impact of beef imports from Brazil. 
We've worked with asset managers such as Storebrand to help inform investor engagement. So in this example, uh, Storebrand used Trace to rank companies in their portfolio according to their deforestation exposure, prioritize which companies to engage with, uh, review their performance over time, and potentially divest from companies that are failing to make progress on deforestation. We've also produced a report last year for the German government mapping their national exposure to imported deforestation. This was probably the most comprehensive assessment of uh, national exposure to deforestation that we know of, because as well as the subnational detail that I've been talking about a lot today, we also included a more holistic and global assessment of Germany's exposure to deforestation using national level data sets too. If you're interested in that work, uh, I encourage you to check it out. Finally, I'll just mention um, something slightly related to that, uh, which is our Global Environmental Impacts of Consumption, or GEIC, indicator. And this is a measure that we've developed um, to understand how countries all around the world are linked to environmental impacts, including deforestation, but also looking at other impacts, such as on biodiversity and water use, uh, through their consumption. And this uses a slightly different approach to what I've been talking about today, and uses a global model um, but I just want to mention this because uh, just to make the point that we have other kinds of data available and we're working on other questions um, to tackle other questions on global trade, sustainability and consumption. Um, one exciting thing to note about this actually is that it's been adopted as a component indicator under CBD's COP15 um, global biodiversity framework. So that's quite an exciting development there. I'll finish here, so thank you so much for listening. Uh, to explore our tools and insights, visit our website at trace.earth. For more information on future webinars like this one, if this has been useful, uh, please, you can share it with your colleagues. We'll have more regular webinars happening in the future. You can join our mailing list at, uh, if you've not already done so. And if you have any specific queries or follow-ups, then do send us an email at info at trace.earth. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, hopefully, I've left plenty of time for any questions that you might have. Thanks very much, Mark. That was a great presentation. Uh, I hope that it was helpful for everyone attending today to better understand trace methods and data. I can see there's already some questions in the Q&A box, so uh, I'm just going to group them together and bring them up. Uh, for Mark and Andre to answer. Um, we've got, as ever, some questions about the sources and limits of data. Uh, there's a question about what the sources of data are, which I think Mark has already answered. Um, but as to the limits of data, one attendee has asked, uh, what's the error margin in data assumptions? And, and likewise, another attendee, Sajiv Monkuma, says that he's curious about the allocation approach used to extend regional or national level commodity production data to companies and traders. Is this data available publicly? And do we see any drawbacks in this approach of allocating um, in deducing insights on companies based on their location data? Do we have any sensitivity or uncertainty analysis on this? So I think both these questions are about um, how precise our conclusions from our data are. So Mark, would you like to comment on that? Yep, both really good questions. Um, so the certainty or uncertainty on our data varies um, between different commodities in different uh, countries based on the data that we have available. Um, for some of our models, we can be basically entirely data driven. Um, and by that, I mean, we, the data is out there and we simply connect it together to, to make these supply chain maps. And we can be fairly sure of those. So those are um, models like our Indonesian wood pulp, uh, for example, where we can get right down to the concession level with very high degree of certainty. Um, we then have a sort of next tier down of models where we rely slightly more on some modeling 
Uh, that includes our Brazilian soy model and our Indonesian palm oil model, um, where we're, we're confident in, in the data that we have, um, but there's slightly more uncertainty because we can't simply connect the shipment all the way to the producing location based on publicly disclosed, publicly disclosed data. Um, and then there are some of our models are slightly more uncertain where we depend slightly more on, on the modeling. Uh, and this is things like our Paraguay soy model, for example. Um, so it, it depends on the context, really. Um, and just working with the data that's available. One of the constraints we have is that all of the data that we use is publicly available. Uh, and so that's what we have to go from. So we don't use data disclosed by individual traders, for example, on their own sourcing patterns currently. Um, we simply connect data that's publicly available and repurpose it. So that's why there will be some uncertainty, um, but it depends, as I say, on the context. Thanks, Mark. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Andre, or we can move to the next questions. No, I think that's very clear. Perhaps we can move to the other question uh, that you mentioned, which is regarding the, the methods that we use to allocate different to, to trade. Yeah, great. Just to highlight, um, before we move to any other questions, just to highlight that um, what Mark said about each context having its own approach and uh, by, by which I mean each combination of country and commodity having its own approach and data sources. If you look at our website, trace.earth, there is a section where the methods and the limitations for each uh, of those combinations is set out in a separate document. So if you're interested in delving into any particular area, you can, you can see that on the methods section of our website. Um, so you wanted to talk more, Andre, about the the allocation of. I mean, I think I think Mark may have covered that, but I don't know if this if you wanted to add. I just wanted to add a point because I, I found it a very interesting uh, question. Uh, I mean, and I wanted to come first explain that we are, you know, a science, uh, science uh, driven uh, initiative. So, um, and what we do is basically getting all the information that is available out there to make whatever, I mean, the best that we can do in terms of mapping the supply chains and, and linking them to deforestation. So when it comes to allocating the deforestation exposure to traders uh, is indeed uh, a, a science method that was published uh, back in 2016. And we've been publishing a few papers in scientific journals uh, around that. There are, I mean, uh, we believe, as Mark said, that the data that we have uh, is uh, is the best that we that's best that is out there in terms of mapping uh, supply chains. Uh, but it's important to mention that we don't uh, say that those companies are driving deforestation themselves, but they are actually exposed to the, this deforestation. And uh, so we increase the transparency in the supply chains, uh, but we are very welcome to also to, for example, work with traders when they are not happy with the exposure for them to disclose more data. So what we do at the end of the day by increasing transparency is to really push companies to, you know, to disclose more information, to be more transparent in their supply chains and therefore, we can move, you know, a whole commodities and supply chains to more sustainable and different station free. Great, thanks, Andre. Um, Athena, maybe you can share some of our analysis on the Indonesian palm oil data that we released last year in the chat box, because I think that's a great example. You, we can see that when we did the supply chain mapping for Indonesian palm oil last year, we were able to draw on a lot more uh, in the way of company disclosure of their traceability reports compared to some other places uh, and in some other, the case of some other commodities and that that affected um, the confidence of the results as well. So uh, the sectors that have more developed disclosure will tend to have more will have tend to have better better models. Um, okay, 
Uh, so moving on to another set of questions, we've got uh, a group of questions that are about basically these choices of countries and commodities that we cover. So, you know, some of the attendees have asked, why do we prioritize certain countries in the analysis? Do we plan to include more countries? What about other commodities like avocados? There's no avocados on the trace platform. And we had one specific question, which was um, in terms of not only will, you know, can we expand the coverage of countries, but specifically, can we show the risks related to soy production in China, um, similar to the way that we show the risks of soy production in Brazil? So I think this is one big group of questions about how we choose countries and commodities. Uh, Mark, would you like to take that, please? Yes. Um, so we try and prioritize countries and commodities based on the deforestation impacts um, that we know those commodities have and how important they are to uh, international trade. And it's quite a lot of time and um, effort from our team to map these commodities. Um, so it's really a case of, of prioritization. It's also um, a case of diminishing returns. So uh, if we continue to um, try and map all the commodities, it becomes increasingly less useful exercise because they make up uh, an increasingly small proportion of global deforestation uh, and global exports. Um, that said, we are trying to expand to some other commodities to maximize the coverage that we have. Um, this includes uh, Brazilian soy, which I mentioned, uh, sorry, Argen, um, Bolivian soy, <laughs> which I mentioned earlier. Um, we're also trying to update our models as much as possible as well. So um, something you might notice is that for some of our data sets, uh, there's a bit of a lag in the most recent available year. And, and that's because it takes quite a lot of time uh, to update these data sets. And also we're dependent on other data sets, which themselves might not have been updated. And this is things like uh, crop production uh, data and, and spatially explicit information on crop production. Uh, as well as the trade records themselves. Um, so there is a bit of a lag there. We'll be updating our Brazilian beef data this year, which is quite exciting because that's a really important contributor to deforestation at the global, state, at the global scale. I don't Great. know if you want to um, add anything, Andre? Maybe specifically on the question of soy production in China, we were asked about that, if we can respond to that. Yes. Um, so in theory, we, we, the approach we take can be applied to anywhere. So it's a case of weighing up how important that is. And also just to say, we currently focus on um, tropical deforestation only. So um, that's partly why we haven't focused on, on soy production in China at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, we also had a question uh, from an attendee about how it is that companies or the finance sector can use trace to improve their supply chain performance uh, mark would you like to comment yeah so the idea is that trace can be really used as um a starting point figuring out which companies um that companies themselves might wish to engage with and which uh, financial institutions um, might be exposed to deforestation. So it's a, it's a case of prioritizing engagement, really. Um, so financial institutions could use it to assess um, their exposure to deforestation through the companies that they're invested in, um, which we can access through our Trace Finance website. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's, it's about informing that dialogue, figuring out where they might be most exposed to deforestation uh, so that they can then have these conversations with their suppliers and start to tackle the problem, which has now hopefully been simplified rather than being something that's very nebulous and, and, and difficult to pin down. We can use trace to simplify that problem and figuring out where those entry points are. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, Andre, did you want to add anything to that? I think Mark replied really well and um, covered everything. Thing. But just to mention <clears throat> that before a trace, some companies, especially in the downstream part of the supply chain, didn't have because of the complexity of 
Oh dear, I'm afraid we seem to have lost Andre uh, in the middle of that comment about complexity. Hopefully he'll be able to rejoin, uh, but maybe just to build on something that Mark mentioned about how finance sector and financial institution, uh, financial institutions can use trace data to engage. Um, we have actually recently had a series of webinars on due diligence specifically, how investors and lenders can use trace data in order to support due diligence efforts in order to tackle deforestation in their portfolios. Um, so you'll see uh, Athena has put an introductory webinar recording in the links. Um, there was also a more recent one that we, uh, webinar that we held together with WWF Singapore, um, where they talked about the progress of uh, banks in Asia on addressing nature related risks as well. And in that webinar, we had a representative from First Centia Investors talking about how she uses um, data, including trace data and various other tools provided by, by Global Canopy um, to address deforestation uh, in, in her portfolios. So uh, that could be worth watching if somebody wants to understand the use by financial institutions uh, better. Um, we seem to still have lost Andre, which is a, a pity. Um, hopefully he will be able to rejoin shortly. Um, in the meantime, we seem to have come to the end of the questions that were left in the Q&A box. I don't know if anyone else has further questions that you would like to ask about trace methods or our data. Um, if not, um, I don't know whether there's any work that we've done um, with companies that you would like to expand on further, Mark. Um, um, I think I'd mainly just say that how companies can use our data is also a bit dependent on the visibility that they already have on their own supply chains. Um, so if companies know which traders they're sourcing from, that's really helpful because we can then uh, narrow down our information to be more uh, specific and bespoke for them. Um, but even if they just know which countries they're sourcing from, uh, this can be really helpful as a starting point because currently these um, kind of international trade flows and any impact that they might have are just so opaque. Uh, and so by connecting these different data sets together, hopefully we can make some headway and uh, help these companies start to tackle the problem. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm also just going to put into the chat now um, a link to recent guidance released by the Forest Positive Coalition of the Consumer Goods Forum, uh, which is a coalition which includes some of the largest consumer goods retailers and manufacturers in the world. Uh, I just want to highlight that um, there's also some information there and recommendations on how uh, companies looking at their supply chains can classify the origins of soy uh, sourcing by risk levels and um, Trace has also contributed some, some recommendations and insights there. So that's also um, guidance that could be considered by companies uh, wishing to tackle this. And we have Andre, he is back. Um, Andre, you were in the middle of talking about the complexity of global supply chains. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, my internet has been a little bit unstable, but just going back to the question on uh, how companies can use uh, trace data, I was talking about um, how we've been supporting some companies here in the UK through the UK Soy Manifesto, as Mark said, to really use trace data as a starting point. Because before we increased this transparency and we released this data on supply chains, uh, there wasn't really any information that you know companies that are a little bit more further in the downstream part of the supply chain, they couldn't see where the soil that they were sourcing was coming from or where 
deforestation and CO2 emissions. So we really brought this transparent to a more sort of to the whole to the whole uh, of of Brazil in this case of the soy uh, in the meaning of where all the soy is coming from. So I think that really helped uh, as a sort of a starting point, and then the companies can dig further uh, in their supply chains and and engage the companies that are with the traders that are most expensive. Thanks, Andre. Um, and that actually links nicely to another question that has just come in. Um, somebody has asked if we can explain a little bit more about the mathematical model used to create the link between ports of exports and regions of sourcing. So we've talked a bit about how we use asset data, but maybe we can uh, go into a bit more detail. Uh, and the second part of that question is whether companies and financial institutions can do more to bring about more transparency um, in that last link. Uh, Mark? Yep, so the mathematical models that we use, um, we essentially use uh, something called linear programming, um, which is a kind of optimization. And to uh, feed into that, we use information such as transport distances, um, constrained by various factors, um, such as uh, production constraints, uh, the crushing uh, capacities of particular facilities, for example. Um, and these feed in to kind of optimize the allocation of a commodity um, to particular sourcing regions or particular uh, facilities. Um, and in terms of what anything that companies and financial institutions can do, um, I think part of it is just about um, pushing sector wide for more disclosure. So this could be working with other companies in the same sector um, to encourage a kind of common approach about making these things more transparent. Um, there are some encouraging signs with things like the EU due diligence legislation coming in, which we hope will kind of create a bit of a step change in pushing for this greater transparency and traceability in supply chains more generally. Um, although it's worth saying that part of the reason that that has gone through is because it had a lot of support from the private sector. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we would like to see more of that support in general from companies and financial institutions um, to help push for this change. Thanks, Mark. Um, we have another question from Sajiv Mohan Kumar asking about whether Trace will extend our data to, uh, I think, to other impact indicators such as carbon. And how do we connect trace data or how is it connected to other spatial tools or databases on deforestation, land use, land use change, like Global Forest Watch? Um, he asks, are there too many <laughs> different databases and resources out there? Uh, so I guess two questions, carbon and how does it link to other databases? Uh, Mark? Yep. So for the first part, um, we can essentially connect our supply chains to any impact metrics that we're interested in. Um, so currently our kind of basic package, as we call it, of indicators that we use are deforestation exposure. And also we look at emissions as well. So we look at uh, the net emissions and gross emissions from land use change. Um, we're also looking at various other metrics as well, uh, which we'd ideally extend to. Uh, so we have a research program focused on uh, what we call trace H2O, so connecting it to water impacts, um, and also looking at biodiversity as well, which is, um, I think, increasingly in demand from the private sector. Uh, so trying to extend to these other metrics where we can. The other thing to say is that because our data is all available uh, publicly, um, we're encouraging other researchers to, to make use of that data too, um, where we don't have the in-house capacity to do all of this. Uh, and on the second part of the question, um, I think there is a risk that we're going to get too many different data sets and resources out there. And we need to make sure that these different things and different tools are complementary and not competing or even giving conflicting answers, because that would obviously um, be potentially to the opposite of what we want. Um, but uh, we do uh, work with a lot of these other platforms um, and getting our data integrated onto those so that they can kind of piece together in a consistent way um, rather than giving slightly different answers to the same question, which is a risk. Uh, 
thanks very much, Mark. Um, and yes, you can, you know, by the same on the same platforms that Mark demonstrated earlier, where you can look at deforestation exposure, you can also access our existing data on emissions. So uh, please feel free to browse and look at that. Um, I'm also going to put into the links um, in the chat box um, a link to a recent academic publication uh, with several trace co-authors on it actually, which linked the trace data to certain wildlife indicators uh, as, as other measures of biodiversity other than deforestation. Um, in case that's of interest to anyone, it is, however, an academic publication. Uh, we're hoping to make a more sort of general reader friendly version of this in, in due course, but it is an example of what could be done uh, with the same supply chain mapping approach um, with other indicators that are not yet available on our platform. Um, Sorry, just to add to that as well. Um, I briefly mentioned at the end some of the kind of more global um, modeling that we've been doing. Um, and for that, so if you go to a website called commodityfootprints.earth, um, which is a separate to our trace website, but um, uh, is, is partly uh, supported by trace. Um, that's where we have this global environmental impacts of consumption indicator. And for that, we have um, several different metrics of impact that you can choose. And that includes uh, proxies for biodiversity, uh, water use, emissions, uh, and other metrics like that. So um, we have a slightly broader uh, array of, of measures for that, that global analysis than we do for our subnational models. All right, um, I think we are coming into the final five minutes of the webinar. So this is your final chance. If you have any questions, please put them in that Q and A box. Um, and we will, we will be very happy to answer them. Uh, but if not, then uh, it just remains for me to thank everyone for joining this webinar today and for the many excellent and interesting questions. Also like to thank our interpreters for their simultaneous interpretation of this webinar. As a reminder, we will be sharing recordings of the webinar in both English and Mandarin. Uh, and so that will be with you soon. Please feel free to share them with colleagues or contacts whom you think would be interested. We will also be holding uh, further iterations or further instances of uh, this webinar in due course. So at the moment, they're scheduled for every two months. So the next one will be in May. Uh, so please, uh, if there's anyone else whom you think would be interested, please do feel free to let them know. If you want to come back and ask further questions that uh, keep you <laughs> up awake at night, you wake up in the middle of the night, I should have asked this question about Trace, uh, please come come back and ask again. Um, you can also join our mailing list at, uh, actually we have some slides for this. Mark, can you put up the slide with the link? Um, we have some, we have a, a link for joining the mailing list as well, if you'd like to receive updates on our events and data. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please just drop us a note at any time. We'd love to, to hear from you. Uh, finally, when you leave this webinar, there will be a short survey appearing in your web browser. If it doesn't appear right away, you might need to press refresh. We would be extremely grateful if you could fill that in so that we can understand better what worked for you in this session, what didn't, uh, and what you might like to see from Trace in the future. Athena has also very helpfully put the link to the survey in the chat box. Um, so uh, that was all. Thank you once again. We are really glad that you could join us today. And uh, we hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation and that we hear from you again. All right. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.